The Life of the Honorable William F. Cody Written by Buffalo Bill Cody Narrated by Michael Anthony Scott Produced by Thought Audio The Life of the Honorable William F. Cody Known as Buffalo Bill The Famous Hunter, Scout, and Guide an autobiography written by myself in 1879. Adventures on the Overland Road As the warm days of summer approached, I longed for the cool air of the mountains, and to the mountains I determined to go. After engaging a man to take care of the farm, I proceeded to Leavenworth, and there met my old wagon master and friend, Lewis Simpson, who was fitting out a train at Atchison and loading it with supplies for the Overland Stage Company, of which Mr. Russell, my old employer, was one of the proprietors. Simpson was going with his train to Fort Laramie and points further west. Come along with me, Billy, he said. I'll give you a good layout. I want you with me. I don't know that I would like to go as far west as that again, replied I, but I do want to ride the Pony Express once more. There's some life in that. Yes, that's so, but it will soon shake the life out of you, he said. However, if that's what you've got on your mind, set on. You had better come to Atchison with me and see Mr. Russell who I'm pretty certain will give you a situation. I replied that I would do that. I then went home and informed my mother of my intention, and as her health was very poor, I had great difficulty in obtaining her consent. I finally convinced her that as I was of no use on the farm, it would be better and more profitable for me to return to the plains. So after giving her all the money I had earned by trapping, I bade her goodbye and set out for Atchison. I met Mr. Russell there and asked him for employment as a Pony Express rider. He gave me a letter to Mr. Slade, who was then the stage agent for the division extending from Julesburg to Rocky Ridge. Slade had his headquarters at Horseshoe Station, 36 miles west of Fort Laramie, and I made the trip thither in company with Mr. Simpson and his train. Almost the very first person I saw after dismounting from my horse was Slade. I walked up to him and presented Mr. Russell's letter, which he hastily opened and read. With a sweeping glance of his eyes, he took my measure from head to foot and then said, My boy, you are too young for a Pony Express rider. It takes men for that business. I rode two months last year on Bill Trotter's division, sir, and filled the bill then, and I think I am better able to ride now, said I. What? Are you the boy that was riding there and was called the youngest rider on the road? I am that same boy, I replied, confident that everything was now all right for me. I have heard of you before. You are a year or so older now, and I think you can stand it. I'll give you a trial anyhow, and if you weaken, you can come back to Horseshoe Station and ten stock. That ended our first interview. The next day, he assigned me to duty on the road from Red Butts to the North Platte, to the three crossings of the Sweetwater, a distance of 76 miles, and I began riding at once. It was a long piece of road, but I was equal to the undertaking, and soon afterwards, had an opportunity to exhibit my power of endurance as a Pony Express rider. One day, 
when I galloped into Three Crossings, my home station. I found that the rider who was expected to take my trip out on my arrival had gotten into a drunken row the night before and had been killed, and that there was no one to fill his place. I did not hesitate for a moment to undertake an extra ride of 85 miles to Rocky Ridge, and I arrived at the latter place on time. I then turned back and rode to Red Butts, my starting place, accomplishing on the round trip a distance of 322 miles. Slade heard of this feat of mine, and one day, as he was passing on a coach, he sang out to me, My boy, you're a brick, and no mistake. That was a good run you made when you rode your own and Miller's routes, and I'll see that you get extra pay for it. Slade, although rough at times, and always a dangerous character, having killed many a man, was always kind to me. During the two years that I worked for him as a Pony Express rider and stage driver, he never spoke an angry word to me. As I was leaving Horse Creek one day, a party of fifteen Indians jumped me in a sand ravine about a mile west of the station. They fired at me repeatedly, but missed their mark. I was mounted on a roan California horse the fleetest steed I had. Putting spurs and whips to him and flying flat on his back, I kept straight on for Sweetwater Bridge, eleven miles distant, instead of trying to turn back to Horse Creek. The Indians came on in hot pursuit, but my horse soon got away from them and ran into the station two miles ahead of them. The stock tender had been killed there that morning and all the stock had been driven off by the Indians, and I was therefore unable to change horses. I continued on to Plout Station, twelve miles further, thus making twenty-four miles straight run with one horse. I told the people at Plout's what had happened at Sweetwater Bridge, and with a fresh horse went on and finished the trip without any further adventure. About the middle of September, the Indians became very troublesome on the line of the stage road along Sweetwater. Between Split Rock and Three Crossings, they robbed a stage, killed the driver and two passengers, and badly wounded Lieutenant Flowers, the assistant division agent. The red-skin thieves also drove off the stock from different stations and were continually lying in wait for the passing stages and Pony Express riders, so that we had to take many desperate chances in running the gauntlet. The Indians had now become so bad and had stolen so much stock that it was decided to stop the Pony Express for at least six weeks and to run the stages but occasionally during that period. In fact, it would have been almost impossible to run the Enterprise much longer without restocking the line. When we were thus nearly all lying idle, a party was organized to go out and search for stolen stock. The party was composed of stage drivers, express riders, stock tenders, and ranchmen, forty of them all together, and they were well armed and well mounted. They were mostly men who had undergone all kinds of hardships and braved every danger, and they were ready and anxious to tackle any number of Indians. While Bill, who had been driving stage on the road and had recently come down to our division, was elected captain of the company. It was supposed that the stolen stock had been taken to the head of the Powder River and vicinity, and the party, of which I was a member, started out for that section in high hopes of success. Twenty miles out from Sweetwater Bridge, at the head of Horse Creek, we found an Indian trail running north towards Powder River, 
and we could see by the tracks that most of the horses had been recently shod and were undoubtedly our stolen stage stock. Pushing rapidly forward, we followed this trail to Powder River, then down this stream to within about 40 miles of the spot where Old Fort Reno now stands. Here, the trail took a more westerly course along the foot of the mountains, leading eventually to Crazy Woman's Fork, a tributary of Powder River. At this point, we discovered that the party whom we were trailing had been joined by another band of Indians. And judging from the fresh appearance of the trail, the united body could not have left this spot more than 24 hours before. Being aware that we were now in the heart of hostile country and that we might at any moment find more Indians than we had lost, we advanced with more caution than usual and kept a sharp lookout. As we were approaching Clear Creek, another tributary of Powder River, we discovered Indians on the opposite side of the creek, some three miles distant. At least, we saw horses grazing, which was a sure sign that there were Indians there. The Indians thinking themselves in comparative safety, never before having been followed so far into their own country by white men, had neglected to put out any scouts. They had no idea that there were any white men in that part of the country. We got the lay of their camp and then held a council to consider and mature a plan for capturing it. We knew full well that the Indians would outnumber us at least three to one, and perhaps more. Upon the advice and suggestion of Wild Bill, it was finally decided that we should wait until it was nearly dark, and then, after creeping as close to them as possible, make a dash through their camp, open a general fire on them, and stampede the horses. This plan, at the proper time, was most successfully executed. The dash upon the enemy was a complete surprise to them. They were so overcome with astonishment that they did not know what to make of it. We could not have astonished them any more if we had dropped down into their camp from the clouds. They did not recover from the surprise of the sudden charge until after we had ridden pell-mell through their camp and got away with our horses as well as theirs. We at once circled the horses around towards the south, and after getting them on the south side of Clear Creek, some twenty of our men, just as the darkness was coming on, rode back and gave the Indians a few parting shots. We then took up our line of march for Sweetwater Bridge, where we arrived four days afterwards with all of our own horses and about 100 captured Indian ponies. The expedition had proved a grand success, and the event was celebrated in the usual manner, by a grand spree. The only store at Sweetwater Bridge did a Russian business for several days. The returned stock hunters drank and gambled and fought. The Indian ponies, which had been distributed among the captors, passed from hand to hand at almost every deal of the cards. There seemed to be no limit to the rioting and carousing. Revelry reigned supreme. On the third day of the orgy, Slade, who had heard the news, came up to the bridge and took a hand in the fun, as it was called. To some variation and excitement to the occasion, Slade got into a quarrel with the stage driver and shot him, killing him almost instantly. The boys became so elevated, as well as elevated, over their success against the Indians that most of them were in favor of going back and cleaning out the whole Indian race. One old driver especially, Dan Smith, 
was eager to open a war on all the hostile nations, and had the drinking been continued another week, he certainly would have undertaken the job, single-handed and alone. The spree finally came to an end. The men sobered down and abandoned the idea of again invading the hostile country. The recovered horses were replaced on the road, and the stages and Pony Express were again running on time. Slade, having taken a great fancy to me, said, Billy, I want you to come down to my headquarters, and I'll make you a sort of a supernumerary rider, and send you out only when it is necessary. I accepted the offer, and went with him down to Horseshoe, where I had a comparatively easy time of it. I'd always been fond of hunting, and I now had a good opportunity to gratify my ambition in that direction, as I had plenty of spare time on my hands. In this connection, I will relate one of my bear hunting adventures. One day, when I had nothing else to do, I saddled up an extra Pony Express horse and arming myself with a good rifle and a pair of revolvers, struck out for the foothills of Laramie Peak for a bear hunt. Riding carelessly along and breathing the cool and bracing autumn air which came down from the mountains, I felt as only a man can feel who is roaming over the prairies of the far west, well armed and mounted on a fleet and gallant steed. The perfect freedom which he enjoys is in itself a refreshing stimulant to the mind as well as to the body. Such indeed were my feelings on this beautiful day as I rode up the valley of the horseshoe. Occasionally, I scared up a flock of sage hens or a jackrabbit. Antelopes and deer were almost always in sight in any direction but as they were not the kind of game I was after on that day, I passed them by and kept on towards the higher mountains. The further I rode, the rougher and wild became the country, and I knew that I was approaching the haunts of the bear. I did not discover any, however, although I saw plenty of tracks in the snow. About two o'clock in the afternoon, my horse having become tired, and myself being rather weary, I shot a sage hen, and dismounting, I unsaddled my horse and tied him to a small tree, where he could easily feed on the mountain grass. I then built a little fire, and broiling the chicken and seasoning it with salt and pepper, which I had obtained from my saddlebags, I soon sat down to a genuine square meal, which I greatly relished. After resting for a couple of hours, I remounted and resumed my upward trip to the mountains, having made up my mind to camp out that night rather than go back without a bear, which my friends knew I had gone for. As the days were growing short, night soon came on, and I looked around for a suitable camping place. While thus engaged, I scared up a flock of sage hens, two of which I shot, intending to have one for supper and the other for breakfast. By this time it was becoming quite dark, and I rode down to one of the little mountain streams where I found an open place in the timber suitable for a camp. I dismounted, and after unsaddling my horse and hitching him to a tree, I prepared to start a fire. Just then, I was startled by hearing a horse whinnying further up the stream. It was quite a surprise to me, and I immediately ran to my animal to keep him from answering, as horses usually do in such cases. I thought that the strange horse might belong to some roaming band of Indians, as I knew of no white men being in that portion of country at that time. I was certain that the owner of the strange horse could not be far distant, 
and I was very anxious to find out who my neighbor was before letting him know that I was in the vicinity. I therefore resaddled my horse and leaving him tied so that I could easily reach him, I took my gun and started out on a scouting expedition up the stream. I had gone about 400 yards when, in the bend of the stream, I discovered 10 or 15 horses grazing. On the opposite side of the creek, a light was shining high up in the mountain bank. Approaching the mysterious spot as cautiously as possible, and when, within a few yards of the light, which I discovered came from a dugout in the mountainside, I heard voices. And soon, I was able to distinguish the words, as they proved to be in my own language. Then I knew that the occupants of the dugout, whence the voices proceeded, were white men. Thinking that they might be a party of trappers, I boldly walked up to the door and knocked for admission. The voices instantly ceased, and for a moment, a death-like silence reigned inside. Then there seemed to follow a kind of hurried whispering, a sort of consultation, and then someone called out, Who's there? A friend and a white man, I replied. The door opened, and a big, ugly-looking fellow stepped forth and said, Come in. I accepted the invitation with some degree of fear and hesitation, which I endeavored to conceal, as I saw that it was too late to back out and that it would never do to weaken at that point, whether they were friends or foes. Upon entering the dugout, my eyes fell upon eight as rough and villainous-looking men as I ever saw in my life. Two of them I instantly recognized as teamsters who had been driving in Lou Simpson's train a few months before and had been discharged. They were charged with the murdering and robbing of a ranchman, and having stolen his horses, it was supposed that they had left the country. I gave them no signs of recognition, however, deeming it advisable to let them remain in ignorance as to who I was. It was a hard crowd, and I concluded that the sooner I could get away from them, the better it would be for me. I felt confident that they were a band of horse thieves. Where are you going, young man, and who's with you? asked one of the men who appeared to be the leader of the gang. I am entirely alone. I left Horseshoe Station this morning for a bear hunt, and not finding any bears, I had determined to camp out for the night and wait till morning, said I. And just as I was going to camp a few hundred yards down the creek, I heard one of your horses whinnying, and then I came to your camp. I was thus explicit in my statement in order if possible, to satisfy the cutthroats that I was not spying upon them, but that my intrusion was entirely accidental. Where's your horse? demanded the boss thief. I left him down the creek, I answered. They proposed going after the horse, but I thought that that would never do, as it would leave me without any means of escape, and I accordingly said, in hopes to throw them off the track, Captain, I'll leave my gun here and go down and get my horse and come back and stay all night. I said this in as cheerful and as a careless manner as possible so as to not arouse their suspicions in any way or lead them to think that I was aware of their true character. I hated to part with my gun, but my suggestion of leaving it was a part of the plan of escape which I had arranged. If they have the gun, thought I, they would surely believe that I intended to come back. But this little game did not work at all, as one of the desperados spoke up and said, Jim and I will go down with you after your horse, and you can leave your gun here all the same, as you'll not need it.
All right, I replied, for I could certainly have said nothing else. It became evident to me that it would be better to trust myself with two men than the whole party. It was apparent that from this time on, I would have to be on the alert for some good opportunity to give them the slip. Come along, said one of them, and together we went down the creek, and soon came to the spot where my horse was tied. One of the men unhitched the animal and said, I'll lead the horse. Very well, said I. I've got a couple of sage hens here. Lead on. I picked up the sage hens, which I had killed a few hours before, and followed the man who was leading the horse while his companion brought up the rear. The nearer we approached the dugout, the more I dreaded the idea of going back among the villainous cutthroats. My first plan of escape having failed, I now determined upon another. I had both of my revolvers with me, the thieves not having thought necessary to search me. It was not quite dark, and I purposely dropped one of the sage hens and asked the man behind me to pick it up. While he was hunting for it on the ground, I quickly pulled out one of my Colt's revolvers and struck him a tremendous blow on the back of the head knocking him senseless to the ground. I then instantly wheeled around and saw that the man ahead, who was only a few feet distance, had heard the blow and had turned to see what was the matter, his hand upon his revolver. We faced each other at about the same instant, but before he could fire, as he tried to do, I shot him dead in his tracks. Then jumping on my horse, I rode down the creek as fast as possible, through the darkness and over the rough ground and rocks. The other outlaws in the dugout, having heard the shot which I fired, knew there was trouble, and they all came rushing down the creek. I suppose, by the time they reached the man whom I'd knocked down, that he had recovered and hurriedly told them of what had happened. They did not stay with the man whom I shot, but came on in hot pursuit of me. They were not mounted, and were making better time down the rough canyon than I was on horseback. From time to time, I heard them gradually gaining on me. At last, they had come so near that I saw that I must abandon my horse. So I jumped to the ground and gave him a hard slap with the butt of one of my revolvers, which started him on down the valley while I scrambled Mark, while I scrambled up the mountainside. I had not ascended more than forty feet when I heard my pursuers coming closer and closer. I quickly hid behind a large pine tree, and in a few moments they all rushed past me, being led on by the rattling footsteps of my horse which they heard ahead of them. Soon, I heard them firing at random at the horse, as they no doubt supposed I was still seated on his back. And as soon as they had passed me, I climbed further up the steep mountain, and knowing that I had given them the slip, and feeling certain that I could keep out of their way, I at once struck out for Horseshoe Station, which was twenty-five miles distant. I had hard traveling at first, but on reaching lower and better ground, I made good headway, walking all night and getting into the station just before daylight, foot sore, weary, and generally played out. I immediately waked up the men of the station and told them of my adventure. Slade himself happened to be there, and at once organized a party to go out and hunt up the horse thieves. Shortly after daylight, twenty well-armed stage drivers, stock tenders, and ranchmen were galloping in the direction of the dugout. Of course, I went along with the party, notwithstanding I was very tired and had had hardly any rest at all. We had a brisk ride and arrived in the immediate vicinity of the thieves' rendezvous at about ten o'clock in the morning. We approached the dugout cautiously 
but upon getting in close proximity to it, we could discover no horses inside. We could see the door of the dugout standing wide open, and we then searched up to the place. No one was inside, and the general appearance of everything indicated that the place had been deserted, that the birds had flown. Such indeed proved to be the case. We found a new-made grave where they evidently buried the man whom I had shot. We made a thorough search of the whole vicinity and finally found their trail going southeast in the direction of Denver. As it would have been useless to follow them, we rode back to the station, and thus ended my eventful bear hunt. We had no more trouble for some time from horse thieves after that. During the winter of 1860 and the spring of 1861, I remained at Horseshoe, occasionally riding Pony Express and taking care of stock. Fast Driving It was in the spring of 1861 while I was at Horseshoe, that the eastern-bound coach came in one day, loaded down with passengers and baggage, and stopped for dinner. Horseshoe being a regular dinner station as well as a home station. The passengers consisted of six Englishmen, and they had been continually grumbling about the slow time that was being made by the stages, saying that the farther they got east, the slower they went. These blasted earthlings don't know anything about staging anyhow, remarked one of them. Blarst me bloody eyes. They can't stage in this country as we do in England, you know, said another. Their remarks were overheard by Bob Scott, who was to drive the coach from Horseshoe to Fort Laramie, and he was determined to give them satisfaction before they got over his route. Scott was known to be the best range man and the most expert driver on the whole line of the road. He was a very gentlemanly fellow in his general appearance and conduct, but at times he would become a reckless daredevil and would take more desperate chances than any other driver. He delighted in driving wild teams on the darkest nights over a mountain road and had thus become the hero of many a thrilling adventure. It happened on this day he was to drive a team of six Pony Express horses, which had been only partially broken in as a stage team. As the stock tenders were hitching them up, Bob, who was standing by, said, I'll show them Englishmen that we blustered heathens do know something about staging in this country. We all knew from Bob's look that something was up. It required several men to hitch up this frisky team, as a man had to hold on to each one of the horses by the bits while they were stringing them out. The Englishmen came out from dinner and were delighted to see the horses prancing and pawing as if anxious to start. Ah, my dear fellow, now we'll have a fine ride this afternoon, said one of them. By Jove, these are the kind of horses they ought to have on all the teams, remarked another. Are you the lad who's going to drive us today? asked another of Bob. Yes, gentlemen, answered Bob. I'll show you how we stage it in this country. Bob mounted the box, gathered the lines, and pulling the horses strongly by the bits, he sang out to the Englishmen, all aboard. Bob's companion on the box was Captain Cricket a little fellow who was the messenger of the coach. After everybody was seated, Bob told the stock tenders to turn them loose. We, who were standing around to see the stage start out, expected it would go off at a lively rate. We were considerably surprised, therefore, when, after the horses had made a few lively jumps, Bob put on the big California brakes and brought them down to a walk. The road for a distance of four miles gradually rose to the top of a hill, and all the way up this ascent, Bob held the impatient team in check. Blarst your eyes, driver. Why don't you let them go 
exclaimed one of the passengers, who had all along been expecting a very brisk ride. Every once in a while, they would ask him some such question, but he paid no attention to them. At last, he reached the top of the hill, and then he suddenly flung three of the lines on the left side of the team and the other three on the right side. He then began playing the silk to them, that is to say, he began to lash them unmercifully. The team started off like a streak of lightning, so to speak, without a single rein being held by the driver. Bob cried out to the Englishman, saying, Hold on, gentlemen, and I'll give you a lively ride and show you how to stage it in the Rocky Mountains. His next movement was to pull the lamps out of the sockets and throw them at the leaders. The glass broke upon their backs and nearly set them wild, but being so accustomed to running the road, they never once left the track and went flying on down the grade towards the next station eight miles distant, the coach bouncing over the loose stones and small obstacles and surging from side to side as an eggshell would in the rapids of Niagara. Not satisfied with the breakneck rate at which they were traveling, Bob pulled out his revolver and fired in rapid succession, at the same time yelling in a demonical manner. By this time, the Englishmen had become thoroughly frightened as they saw the lines flying wildly in every direction and the team running away. They did not know whether to jump out or remain in the coach. Bob would occasionally look down from his seat and seeing their frightened faces would ask, Well, how do you like staging in this country now? The Englishman stuck to the coach, probably thinking it would be better to do so than to take the chances of breaking their necks by jumping. As the flying team was nearing the station, the stock tender saw that they were running away and that the driver had no control over them whatever. Being aware that the Pony Express horses were accustomed to running right into the stable on arriving at the station. He threw open the large folding doors, which would just allow the passage of the team and the coach into the stable. The horses, sure enough, made for the open doorway. Captain Cricket, the messenger, and Scott got down on the boot of the coach to save themselves from colliding with the top of the stage door. The coach would probably have passed through into the stable without any serious damage had it not been for the bar or threshold that was stretched across the ground to fasten the doors to. This bar was a small log, and the front wheel struck it with such force that the coach was thrown up high enough to strike the upper portion of the door frame. The top of the coach was completely torn off, and one of the passengers' arms was broken. This was the only serious injury that was done, though it was a matter of surprise to all that any of the travelers escaped. The coach was backed out when the running gear was found to be as good as ever. The top was soon patched up, a change of team was made, and Bob Scott, mounting the box as if nothing had happened, took the reins in hand and shouted, All aboard! Englishmen, however, had had enough of Bob Scott and not one of the party was willing to risk his life with him again. They said that he was drunk, or crazy, or both, and that they would report him and have him discharged for what he had already done. Bob waited a few minutes to give them an opportunity to take their seats in the coach, but they told him most emphatically that he could not drive on without them, as they intended to wait there for the next stage but they told him emphatically that he could drive on without them, as they intended to wait there for the next stage. And Bob drove away without a single passenger. He made his usual time into Fort Laramie, which was the end of his run. The Englishman came through on the next day's coach and proceeded to Atchison, where they reported Bob to the superintendent of the line, who, however, paid little or no attention to the matter as Bob remained on the row. Such is the story of the liveliest and most reckless piece of stage driving that ever occurred on the Overland Stage Road. Questionable Proceedings Having been away from home nearly a year 
and having occasionally heard of my mother's poor health, I determined to make her a visit. So procuring a pass over the road, I went to Leavenworth, arriving there about June 1, 1861, going from there home. The Civil War had broken out, and excitement ran high in that part of the country. My mother, of course, was a strong Union woman and had such great confidence in the government that she believed the war would not last over six months. Leavenworth at that time was quite an important outfitting post for the West and Southwest, and the fort there was garrisoned by a large number of troops. While in the city one day, I met several of the old as well as the young men who had been members of the Free State Party all through the Kansas Troubles, and who had, like our family, lost everything at the hands of the Missourians. They now thought a good opportunity offered to retaliate and get even with their persecutors, as they were all considered to be secessionists. That they were all secessionists, however, was not true, as all of them did not sympathize with the South. But the Free State men, myself among them, took it for granted that as Missouri was a slave state, the inhabitants must all be secessionists, and therefore our enemy. A man by the name of Chandler proposed that we organize an independent company for the purpose of invading Missouri and making war on its people on our own responsibility. He at once went about it in a very quiet way and succeeded in inducing 25 men to join him in the hazardous enterprise. Having a longing and revengeful desire to retaliate upon the Missourians for the brutal manner in which they had treated and robbed my family, I became a member of Chandler's company. His plan was that we should leave our homes and parties of not more than two or three together and meet at a certain point near Westport, Missouri, on a fixed day. His instructions were carried out to the letter, and we met at the rendezvous at the appointed time. Chandler had been there some days before us, and thoroughly disguised, had been looking around the country for the whereabouts of all the best horses. He directed us to secretly visit certain farms and collect all the horses possible and bring them together the next night. This we did, and upon reassembling it, was found that nearly every man had two horses. We immediately struck out for the Kansas line, which we crossed at the Indian Ferry on the Kansas River, above Wyandotte. And as soon as we had set foot upon Kansas soil, we separated with the understanding that we were to meet one week from that day at Leavenworth. Some of the parties boldly took their confiscated horses into Leavenworth, while others rode them to their homes. This action may look to the reader like horse stealing and some people might not hesitate to call it by that name. But Chandler plausibly maintained that we were only getting back our own or the equivalent from the Missourians, and as the government was waging war against the South, it was perfectly square and honest, and we had a good right to do it. So we didn't let our consciences trouble us very much. We continued to make similar raids upon the Missourians off and on during the summer and occasionally we had run in fights with them. None of the skirmishes, however, amounted to much. The government officials, hearing of our operations, put detectives upon our track, and several of the party were arrested. My mother, upon learning that I was engaged in this business, told me it was neither honorable nor right, and she would not for a moment countenance any such proceedings. Consequently, I abandoned the Jayhawken enterprise, for such it really was. About this time, the government bought from Jones and Cartwright several ox trains, which were sent to Rolla, Missouri, all being put in charge of my old and gallant friend, Wild Bill, who had just become the hero of the day on account of a terrible fight which he had with a gang of desperados and outlaws, who infested the border under the leadership of the then-notorious Jake McCandless. In this fight, he had killed McCandless and three of his men. The affair occurred while Wild Bill was riding the Pony Express in western Kansas. 
the custom with the express riders, when within half a mile of a station, was either to begin shouting or blowing a horn in order to notify the stock tender of his approach and to have a fresh horse already saddled for him on his arrival so that he could go right on without a moment's delay. One day, as Wild Bill neared Rock Creek Station, where he was to change horses, he began shouting as usual at the proper distance. But the stock tender, who had been married only a short time, and his wife, living with him at the station, did not, Mark, did not make his accustomed appearance. Wild Bill galloped up, and instead of finding the stock tender ready for him with a fresh horse, he discovered him lying across the stable floor with the blood oozing from a bullet hole in his head. The man was dead, and it was evident that he had been killed only a few moments before. In a second, Wild Bill jumped from his horse, and looking in the direction of the house, he saw a man coming towards him. The approaching man fired on him at once, but missed his aim. Quick as lightning, Wild Bill pulled his revolver and returned the fire. The stranger fell dead, shot through the brain. Bill, Bill, help, help, save me. Such was the cry that Bill now heard. It was the shrill and pitiful voice of the dead stock tender's wife, and it came from a window of the house. She had heard the exchange of shots and knew that Wild Bill had arrived. He dashed over the dead body of the villain whom he had killed, and just as he sprang into the door of the house, he saw two powerful men assaulting the woman. One of the desperados was in the act of striking her with the butt end of a revolver, and while his arm was raised, Bill sent a ball crashing through his skull, killing him instantly. Two other men now came rushing from an adjoining room, and Bill, seeing that the odds were three to one against him, jumped into a corner, and then firing, he killed another of the villains. Before he could shoot again, the remaining two men closed in upon him, one of whom had drawn a large bowie knife. Bill wrenched the knife from his grasp and drove it through the heart of the outlaw. The fifth and last man now grabbed Bill by the throat and held him at arm's length. But it was only for a moment, as Bill raised his own powerful right arm and struck his antagonist's left arm such a terrible blow that he broke it. The disabled desperado, seeing that he was no longer a match for Bill, jumped through the door, and mounting a horse, he succeeded in making his escape, being the sole survivor of the Jake McCandless gang. While Bill remained at the station with the terrified woman until the stage came along, and then consigned her to the care of the driver. Mounting his horse, he at once galloped off, and soon disappeared in the distance, making up for lost time. This was the exploit that was on everybody's tongue and in every newspaper. It was one of the most remarkable and desperate hand-to-hand -hand encounters that has ever taken place on the border. I happened to meet Wild Bill at Leavenworth as he was about to depart for Rolla. He wished me to take charge of the government trains as a sort of assistant under him, and I gladly accepted the offer. Arriving at Rolla, we loaded the trains with freight and took them to Springfield, Missouri. On our return to Rolla, we had heard a great deal of talk about the approaching fall races at St. Louis, and Wild Bill, having brought a fast-running horse from the mountains, determined to take him to that city and match him against some of the high fires there. And down to St. Louis we went with this running horse, placing our hopes very high on him. Wild Bill had no difficulty in making up a race for him, all the money that he and I had, we put up on the mountain runner. And as we thought we had a sure thing, we also bet the horse against $250. I rode the horse myself, but nevertheless, our sure thing, like many another sure thing, proved a total failure. And we came out of that race minus the horse and every dollar we had in the world. Before the race, it had been make or break with us and we got broke. We were busted in the largest city we had ever been in, and it is no exaggeration to say that we felt mighty blue.
On the morning after the race, we went to the military headquarters, where Bill succeeded in securing an engagement for himself as a government scout, but I, being so young, failed in obtaining similar employment. While Bill, however, raised some money by borrowing it from a friend and then buying me a steamboat ticket, he sent me back to Leavenworth while he went to Springfield, which place he made his headquarters while scouting in southeastern Missouri. One night, after he had returned from a scouting expedition, he took a hand in a game of poker, and in the course of the game, he became involved in a, in a quarrel with Dave Tut, a professional gambler, about a watch which he had won from Tut, who would not give it up. Bill told him he had won it fairly, and that he proposed to have it. Furthermore, he declared his intention of carrying the watch a across the street next morning to military headquarters, at which place he had to report at nine o'clock. Tut replied that he himself would carry the watch across the street at nine o'clock, and no other man would do it. Mark. Bill then said to Tut that if he attempted anything of the kind, he would kill him. A challenge to a duel had virtually been given and accepted, and everybody knew that the two men meant business. At nine o'clock the next morning, Tut started to cross the street, while Bill, who was standing on the opposite side, told him to stop. At that moment, Tut, who was carrying his revolver in his hand, fired at Bill, but missed him. Bill quickly pulled out his revolver and returned the fire, hitting Tut squarely in the forehead and killing him instantly. Quite a number of Tut's friends were standing in the vicinity, having assembled to witness the duel, and Bill, as soon as Tut fell to the ground, turned to them and asked if any one of them wanted to take it up for Tut. If so, he would accommodate any of them then and there. But none of them cared to stand in front of Wild Bill to be shot at by him. Nothing, of course, was ever done to Bill for the killing of Tut. Well, that's about it for now. I hope my tales have brought at least a little liveliness into your hearts. I got to go now, but don't worry too much about me. I am sure to be back. Yours truly, Buffalo Bill Cody.